Barry Lyndon has always seemed like such a strange choice for Stanley Kubrick after A Clockwork Orange. Uh -oh. To follow his dystopian X-rated treatise on free will with a slow PG costume drama? But if we zoom in, we can understand a bit more of the why. I feel like I know the man after all the research I've done, so I hope you forgive me if I sometimes call him Stanley. So Stanley had read about new NASA camera lenses that could capture light at ultra-low levels. Being a technophile, and often looking to push the envelope of filmmaking, a story set in the 18th century would allow these lenses to shine, no pun intended, for a period piece set before electric and gas lighting, enabling him to capture the sublime beauty of purely candlelit scenes. Second, Stanley was a fan of William Makepeace Thackeray, the 19th century British author of Vanity Fair, and once considered making that into a movie, but decided against it for reasons I won't go into here. Third, it would not be too out of line to call Thackeray the 19th century Kubrick, with his cynical, skeptical view of humanity, and his penchant for satirizing and critiquing powerful people and institutions. This includes the movie's closing text, relegating everyone we've just seen to virtual insignificance. It's ripped straight from the book The Luck of Barry Lyndon, where it occurs in the very first chapter. Considering Stanley's placement of it at the very end, where it would have maximum impact, I believe it was the hook that vaulted it into prime consideration to be his next movie. The fact that the book is considered the first English novel with an anti-hero was probably the cherry on top. Stanley had a definite affection for them. Lastly, if you're watching this, you probably already know that Stanley was planning to make a Napoleon epic in the early 70s, but once the money disappeared, and you can find many good videos about it, he wanted a reason to reuse some of the comprehensive research he'd done on late 18th century Europe, and saw the irony of an epic retelling like he'd intended, but now of a consequential nobody. And there's no way he could have not noticed how easily the story of the French emperor could map onto the protagonist of Thackeray's book. Both men, somewhat lonely and impoverished, hailing from the peripheries of their kingdoms, through cunning, skill, and certainly some luck, meteorically ascend their societies and reach their lofty ambitions, only to have sudden falls and subsequent exiles after poor choices and misfortune doomed them. There's this meat grinder in the middle, a little thing called the French Revolution, that affects their paths but in opposite ways. Barry Lyndon could almost be seen as a prequel to the Napoleon story ending in 1789, the year the revolution kicked off, which ended up destroying the world Barry sought so hard to reach, but which opened the door for the young Corsican. It destroyed Barry's dreams, but paved the way for Napoleon's. It's been called the ancient regime, hereditary monarchy, with all the people being the subjects of that monarch. It's got to be the king that was in essence destroyed by the revolution and Napoleon's rise to power. Shall we vote? Not only did the rebels execute their king and queen, but established the people as citizens of a community, not subjects. They are my people. I am their sovereign. I love them. Boom! And enabled their next leader to come from a very non-traditional background. There's no doubt luck was involved. He probably would have risen pretty high up in the ranks, for he was a genuine military genius. Let them think they have the higher ground. But the revolution cut the head off, sometimes literally, of the French military elite, speeding the way for the 24-year-old to become a general. He hooked up with the famous Josephine when he was looking for an experienced aristocratic woman to smooth his ascent into the upper echelons of French society. By the age of 30, he'd become the most powerful man in Europe, if not the world. Not coincidentally, Redmond Barry reaches the height of his powers, marrying his own Josephine, Lady Linden. Thackeray was fascinated by Napoleon. At the age of five, he saw him in exile on St. Helena Island when his ship stopped there during his emigration from India to England in 1817. He later wrote, We reached the garden where we saw a man walking. That is he, said my servant, that is Bonaparte. He eats three sheep every day and all the little children he can lay hands on. There were other people in the British dominions with an equal horror of the Corsican ogre. At 29, he documented the late emperor's second funeral when he was dug up on the island and reburied in Paris to great fanfare. The timing's a little fuzzy, but it's possible the last thing he wrote before Barry Lyndon was literally an essay on Napoleon. So it's no accident 
that when, in 1844, he published Barry Lyndon in serialized form for a monthly magazine, there were clear parallels to the French leader, in addition to real-life European rogues, Andrew Robinson Stoney and Giacomo Casanova, whose bios are definitely worth looking up. Not unlike the reception to many of Stanley's films, readers were dissatisfied with Thackeray's story and complained bitterly that it lacked a purpose and, above all, the customary dosage of moral edification. Thackeray's feelings on Napoleon were fairly complicated. He respected, appreciated, and even admired his rise to power and the reforms he made, but hated that he squandered his chance to truly reform the calcified European hierarchy when he, in essence, joined the aristocracy that he seemed so keen on doing away with. In this way, Barry's nemesis, Lord Bullingdon, symbolizes the ancient regime that was swept aside by the newcomer until it bounced back, defeating and exiling the upstart for his upsetting of the natural order. However, the nobility did not reverse all the ideas and reforms of the vulgar outsider. Napoleon ushered in a more meritocratic society, the rule of law, and something approaching universal education. The common people would now have a say in their own governance, more or less. And perhaps above all, he destroyed the idea of legitimacy. He didn't need someone else to crown him. He just did it himself. Yeah. Crowned himself. The royals, though, hadn't forgotten his low birth status. As Stanley wrote in his Napoleon movie script, in defeat, he would be punished by the kings of Europe, according to a standard which they would not have applied to each other. He might marry the niece of Marie Antoinette and call himself an emperor, but that did not make him one. Here in the very last shot of the movie, I believe we see that twilight of the aristocracy. They would continue to exist, but after the French Revolution and Napoleon's reforms, they never truly regained their previous way of life. As Thackeray put it, the old society, with its courtly splendors, passed away. For Book Barry, who dies around 1814, this was a tragedy. Just as now, things always seemed better in the good old days. He truly bought into the idea that there were betters and inferiors, a mindset that Thackeray satirized. Barry couldn't become a noble if he was lowborn, so he always presented himself, and may have even believed it, that he was descended from ancient Irish kings. It's not a lie if you believe it. Thackeray must have liked this idea of Barry striving so hard to reach the nobility, only for it to lose its potency a few scant years later. Just like Kubrick, he was a fan of tragic irony. Barry has this weird relationship with the French emperor, where his story mirrors his, yet he either doesn't see it or doesn't want to see it, because it would reflect badly on him. Barry isn't known for his astute self-awareness. Ah, oh, Barry. Whereas Napoleon didn't care about the opinion of others, at least initially, Barry is all about the establishment's approval. <laughs> so naturally, he resents the man who undermined the nobility's power and influence after spending the better part of his life trying to ensconce himself in it. If you want to be ensconced, you're buried. And for coming across as vulgar and lowborn in his social climbing when he's done the same thing. He never deigns to call him Emperor or even Napoleon. He refers to him twice in the book. Bonaparte was a beggarly brat in his native island, and another time as that vulgar Corsican who upset the gentry of the world. This was often how enemies insulted Napoleon, by referring to his low birth status. But I call that raggedy ass Napoleon your king? No! FYI, Lady Linden refers to Barry as a vulgar Irish adventurer in the book, a line Stanley used in his early script. But sometime between that draft and the final one, he changed his version of Barry quite a bit, making him significantly less vulgar. Perhaps it was to give the film broader appeal, but it could also be to make the final tragedy more biting. In the literary versions of Barry Lyndon, herein meaning the book and the early script, he's notably darker than the film's more sanitized version. He's described brutally killing people several times while in the army. I drove my bayonet into a poor little ensign, so young, slender, and small, in place of the butt of my musket, with which I clubbed him down. Executes a horse for revenge, I went out and shot the fatal black horse that had killed Brian, and is far crueler to his wife. If I beckoned, she would come fawning up to me like a dog. I brought my high-born wife to kiss my hand, to pull off my boots, to fetch and carry for me like a servant. In the movie, and I know some will disagree, after he's caught kissing their child's nanny, 
he apologizes to his wife, I'm sorry. which she accepts. This mea culpa never happens in either literary version. And while he'd been confining her to their castle, Mary believed that she should give up the pleasures and frivolities of the world. A noticeable shift occurs after his apology. We're taking the children for a ride to the village. We'll be back in time for tea. We'll have a nice time. Along with an absence of infidelity. Hardly a saint, I know, but still an improvement. He even tries to amicably settle his feud with Bullingdon. Do you now consider that you have received satisfaction? Which again is only in the movie. Has Barry genuinely turned a corner? I think so. And not just because his behavior is meaningfully different, but because it makes the final tragedies, losing his son, his leg, his marriage, and his former life, that much more poignant. What was the lonely and broken-hearted man to do? Or is it just pretend? Like Barry and most every other character has been doing this whole time. Barry pretends that he's a proper gentleman. By calling on Redmond Barry Esquire of Berryville. His first duel is a sham, designed purely to get rid of him. The plan of the duel was all arranged, in order to get you out of the way. He deserts the army as... Lieutenant Fakenham. With, of course, ironically triumphant music. He makes up countless stories to strengthen his false identity. Barry was asked a thousand questions about England, which he answered as best he could, inventing a thousand stories. His Prussian girlfriend is exposed as not quite the innocent she seems. This heart of Lesions was like many a neighboring town and had been stormed and occupied several times before Barry came to invest it. Barry pretends to be a servant, then quickly turns into a fake spy, a double agent, for the Chevalier, who also is not as he seems. He's actually a perfect example of this pretense. He's literally adorned with layer upon layer of obfuscation, the wig, the makeup, the patch, the moles, the clothing, the jewelry, even the language he speaks all hide who he really is, making it conveniently easy for Barry to assume his identity too. But I'm on my way to the Austrian ambassador's house. They both pretend to play fairly, but end up cheating their way through the gaming tables of Europe. It's made explicit in the book that everyone's cheating, and Barry and the Chevalier just happen to be the best at it. I believe you have cheated me. Even Barry's war story to his son In three minutes we left as many artillerymen's heads as there were cannonballs is probably made up. That's what the magic show alludes to. Nothing is as it seems. Even the seemingly omniscient narrator takes part, telling us that Captain Quinn was killed in his duel for a young gentleman in difficulty who had killed a man in a duel. But we learn later that wasn't the case at all. The fellow was so frightened that he was an hour in coming to. We'll circle back to his reliability. This is the very last shot of Barry. Notice how his walk to the carriage has a cut right here. And now we only see him from the back, never his face. Probably coincidentally, but fittingly, this is not Ryan O'Neill, but a one-legged double. It's apropos that a character who has pretended his whole life has a different actor portraying him than the star for his final appearance. Stanley could have chosen to give Barry an injury, which does not occur in the book, that would still allow Ryan O'Neill's face to be seen. So did he do this on purpose because it fits the theme of pretense? Take note of the zoom employed here. It's the defining cinematic motif of Barry Lyndon, more specifically the zoom out. If a zoom in encourages us to try to get inside the character's head, like here, then conversely doesn't a zoom out do the opposite, suggesting that it doesn't matter whatever their issue is, like when Barry is pondering his future after attacking Lord Bullingdon? It's a person going from being literally large on screen, i.e. their self-regard, everyone's their own protagonist, to being small, enveloped by the wider world, indicating their true place in the natural order. Watch what happens when we reverse this zoom out, the difference that makes us feel. And notice how the subject is the only thing in focus currently. But by the end, everything is brought into focus. Focus is used to direct our eyes and create depth. So now our eyes are undirected, left to wander wherever. And the image looks flatter with everything in focus, like the contemporary paintings that so influence the movie's aesthetic. And the zoom out doesn't just expand space, but time as well. It of course separates us spatially from the subjects, but also temporally, as they drift further into their 18th century surroundings, implying the triviality of their 
and by extension all of our big, but actually little, problems in the face of the natural world. It also suggests the inscrutability of past people. Try as we might, we'll never fully understand them. We cannot ultimately get inside the head of any other person, so as unknowable as any contemporary person is, now go back in time centuries and try it. As British writer L.P. Hartley said, the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. We'll never totally know Napoleon or Barry or Stanley. There's just too much time and space and pretense intervening. All these levels of interpretation and detachment created the seed, I believe, for the dispassionate narration of the film and the why, or is it ignorance? Who had killed a man in a duel. The shot you hit him with was not likely to hurt him, for it was only made of tow. Regarding Quinn's apparent death. Tow! To paraphrase Thomas Allen Nelson, who literally wrote the book on Kubrick, well, one of the many books, our 21st century lens distorts our view of Kubrick's 20th century cinematic interpretation of a 19th century novelist's reinvention of an 18th century form and subject, which is a man who looks through blue blood-colored glasses at his 17th century heritage. The future, even with its proverbial 2020 hindsight, will never be omniscient regarding the past. No matter how meticulous the reconstruction, even a hyper-authentic film like this one will fall short of complete accuracy. As Stanley said, You don't try and photograph the reality. You try and photograph the photograph of the reality. Time is like a perpetual zoom out, pulling away from the past and flattening it. Each new layer of time, and therefore interpretation, further diminishes the details, shrinking the subjects and pushing them into the background. Stanley relegates these people to distant history, but also empathizes with their basic humanity. Most of this story occurs within a handful of years of 1775, exactly two centuries before the film's release. So I think he's trying to convey, look how much has changed in just 200 years, at least superficially, but underneath it all, we are still the same. The pretenses for war and conflict, and its disillusionment of young men. Remember, the film was made in the shadow of Vietnam. The highs and lows of our interpersonal relationships, the needs and desires of men and women, the love of and for our children, and so on, the universal human condition, as it were, with differences arising mostly due to just where and when we live. How much of our early 21st century ways will seem ridiculous to people of the 23rd century? Probably a lot, but underneath it, they'll be the same as us and the people of the 18th century. You've probably heard the saying, tragedy plus time equals comedy. Not that Barry Lyndon is a comedy per se, but Kubrick certainly uses the ironic narration for comedic purposes. It's funny to us with the distance of several centuries, but not so funny to the people in the middle of it. He would have made an eminent figure in his profession, had he not been killed in a duel. Stanley plays with the narration, using it to undercut the emotions at times, letting us know, for example, that Lady Lyndon will survive her suicide attempt. Though she succeeded only in making herself dangerously ill, due to the very small amount which she swallowed. While at other times enhancing the emotion and the suspense, telling us during a contented moment that Brian is not long for this world. But fate had determined that he should finish his life poor, Very good. lonely, and childless. Then it's a series of tense oh no's as we watch the fateful pieces fall into place. To paraphrase Alfred Hitchcock, a bomb suddenly going off creates 10 seconds of shock, but showing the bomb before it goes off creates 10 minutes of suspense. Promise me you will not ride that horse except in the company of your father. Despite 250 years distance, and of course being fictional, the death of Brian still hits like a hammer. But that's a good thing. Our human condition transcends the temporal, geographic, and cultural distances and we can feel for people so different from us. And Stanley's final irony, his dark joke, is represented in the epilogue. The people you've just spent three hours watching? They don't really matter. They were of little consequence and they're all dead. So how are we to judge past people? Was Napoleon good or bad? Like Barry, there's evidence for both. Stanley said about his directorial ideal, all you can do is pose questions or make truthful observations about human behavior. The only morality is not to be dishonest. The final duel is a culmination of the tragedy. 
For Thackeray, he would have been most likely rooting for the upstart, even an amoral one, to defeat the landed aristocrat. One. But when Barry gets his chance, Two. he quite nobly chooses not to exploit his opponent. I believe he does this for a few reasons. He feels genuine pity for Bullingdon and believes he can put this feud to bed and repair the relationship. He's essentially switched places with Captain Quinn from the first duel. I'm not sorry. And I'll not apologize. Barry's now the diplomatic adult, and Bullingdon is the hot-headed teenager. I have not received satisfaction. He also might still be trying to impress the aristocratic gallery, including his own wife. Shooting her firstborn, and now only son, certainly won't improve their marriage, with the long-shot goal of gaining a peerage. I shall not rest until I see you, Lord Linden. And just possibly a little of what Brian made him promise on his deathbed. Miss me, never to quarrel so. A little Easter egg before I go. The film's most iconic musical theme was composed by George Friedrich Handel, who survived his own duel in 1704 when his opponent's sword hit his metal button instead of his chest. Talk about luck, or as it's been described, chance taken personally. I'll leave you with this question. If Barry had won the coin toss before the duel, it is his. what would have happened? Thank you very much for watching. I apologize for the length. See you next time.